We welcome you all to the south end zone of Kyle Field. It is time for another Yell and Review with our Director of Athletics, Ross Bjork. I'm Will Johnson with Andrew Monaco. It is September. We are about to switch the calendar over to October, and hopefully some weather looks a little more fall-ish when we mm. do. Baby. <laughs> Andrew said on the broadcast Saturday, falls a rumor <laughs> here at College <laughs> Station <laughs> while we were playing Auburn. <laughs> felt like we're playing in Kyle Field, which is – Always nice, and, and the crowd is great, but it felt like we were kind of playing in a bowl of soup down there. Too. <laughs> Such a great disagreement. We were, we were joking. Dave Elmendorf said the weather was gross. Gross. <laughs> gross. It did. It did. It had that gross feeling to it. Didn't yeah, I think fall, I think Andrew's right about I fall so. being a rumor. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. I think we're going to go from uh, summer to, to winter. Yeah. Oh. Good. Which we is relatively right. mild, yeah. obviously, around yeah. here. So I need some fall. Yeah, we yeah. need to get some fall weather. But uh, otherwise uh, – our fall semester and sports, as we call it, is underway. Mm -hmm. uh, before we kind of do a little checkpoint on it all, one of them got a huge win right. last night on the road, Jamie Morrison and Aggie Volleyball. How about how about that yeah. group? <laughs> amazing, uh, amazing match. I mean, to take one, just to take Florida to five sets, you know, on the road. I think Florida's number four mm -hmm. in the country, and I think they'd only lost uh, – one match on on the year, and uh, just to see our ladies fight. I mean, actually could have won the first set. We were up 24-22 or 24-23 going into that uh, last couple points and, and ended up losing the first set and then came back and just an amazing victory. And really, it's it's a foundation. I mean, it's great to celebrate that moment, but it's a long-term play here. We'll celebrate it. Obviously, they can use that as a you know momentum point you know for the season. But it, we're just getting started, and that's mm -hmm. the cool thing is, like, you can see the building blocks being put in place. But uh, I saw a couple of the uh, athletes earlier this week, and, and they were confident. We had just lost to Arkansas on the road, who's a top 15 team, and they were like, you know what, we are we can play better. We can play better. And, uh, hey, let's see what happens at Florida, and sure enough, knock yeah. them off. So that was fun, just fun awesome. to watch last night. Mm -hmm. And it was on ESPN. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was cool to get national – primetime exposure a cool thing at rudy's matches on jimbo's doing his show jimbo and the it, during and the breaks. everybody's kind of watching the, but it yeah jimbo's giving an yeah. answer cheering because yeah. okay. aggies win point. it was just yeah. awesome just absolutely cool. awesome yeah fun environment yeah. no great great win yeah and uh yeah so volleyball taking down number four florida as you said fantastic for coach morrison and that squad uh, doing a little fall checkpoint here uh, as as we get it going. Uh, football three and one will obviously take things up to Arlington uh, this week, but it's always nice to get started on the right foot in SEC play because every one of these Auburn, Arkansas, Alabama doesn't matter who you're playing, each one's a grind. Right, <clears throat> no doubt, and and I think in particular this year. There's so many even teams. I mean, everybody's kind of looking at the, you know, Georgia's obviously setting a, a standard, but everybody's looking at the West and saying, boy, it's wide open. So to me, that means that there's so much balance. It doesn't mean there's bad football teams. It means there's so much balance in our conference, uh, especially on the Western half. And the West has dominated for, I don't know, the last 12 years or so. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's wide open. But to start off on the great home crowd, given the weather – it was definitely hot, 11 a.m. People are thinking, oh, the A&M crowd's not going to be great, and they're not going to show up. Come on. These are <laughs> these are Aggies. Right. It's the 12th man. <clears throat> Tons of energy leading up to that game. Um, so, yeah, to start off on the right foot, to get an SEC victory, to have the defense, you know, really kind of maybe uh, maybe take the right step uh, was, was fun to see. And obviously, uh, you know, we all are, are devastated losing Connor. Yeah. You know, for the season, um, but Max is a warrior. He's going to step up. The team's going to step up. I mean, everybody's going to rally around this, and and uh, let's hey, let's go, let's go play, let's mm -hmm. keep uh, keep playing well. Mm -hmm. Interesting on Friday, uh, cross country, uh, they're going uh, swimming and divings. We'll get things going. Started, Western, right? we'll get right. things going. Friday night is also soccer's turn it gold match. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, we've begun, but just more, more is coming. Right. Yeah, it's actually a, a busy weekend, you know, here here at home with swimming and, and soccer and uh, volleyball. I think is uh, is here at home on uh, on on Sunday as well. So that, I think that'll be a great crowd yeah, uh, after the the big win last night. So yeah, just tons of activity. That that's what's great about you know the fall campus uh, activities is 
every weekend there's something. We just um, we have a concert coming up mm -hmm. at Reed Arena on November the 10th. Riley Green. Green. Is that right? Riley Green. You're, you're a fan of his, right? You know Huge. his music. You got him downloaded. <laughs> yes, I do. I'm sure you do. I can tell. <laughs> it's um, some just of like I do. Just like I do. I yeah. had to. I had to kind of look him up too. Uh, <laughs> but he's he's popular. Uh, but that's great. We're doing those kind of things, right? Where we're making this campus come alive with athletic events, with concerts. Those are the kind of things that we want to do. So yeah, busy fall, and uh, hopefully we'll have great support as we move forward. Oh, and guess what? Both basketball teams begin practice. Oh, yeah. This weekend, hey, I, I, on the, the men's side, boot camp's over. Boot camp so is over. So there's a lot of right. student athletes, right? That and are it's, happy and about it's that. Joking because yeah. uh, I was talking with Boots Ranford, and he said wasn't sure if he was going to come back, and that was part of his decision. But he said, "Look, I, I think I'm in great shape. I always find out what kind of shape." He <laughs> said, "But it's my job now to tell the younger guys when you get through boot camp, that's the toughest thing." Yeah. He said, "And don't think we don't remind each other." At halftime of the Alabama game at Reed Arena, he said, you better believe Alabama didn't go through boot right, camp. Right. There's nothing that we There's, face. Right. And he said, I had yeah. to do it, but also for the for the yeah. younger people. But he had to think about it. He had it. to think about it. He's like, boy, do I want to go through that again? <laughs> yeah, because he's done it, gosh, five years, yes, right? He has. Virginia Tech yes. and then, uh, then coming yep, here. So. Absolutely. But, but yeah, I it's love, hard to believe. I, I love the T-shirt. The standard yep. is the standard. Mm -hmm. which. That's right. You could apply and that to almost any yeah. of our programs, that's correct? Right. That's right. And that's uh, that's what the cool thing about how Buzz, you know, leads and coaches is it's more than just the basketball piece. It's, hey, if we do all these other hard things, the basketball part's going to come easy. But it's hard to believe. Basketball season? Mm -hmm. we're talk I mean, that's what we're talking right about around is corner. right around the corner. Mm -hmm. So exciting times. Let's uh, hopefully keep it rolling. Yep. All right. And uh, we'll get to the line of questioning from the 12th man. As always, if you have a question for Ross, you can submit it at the official website of Texas A&M Athletics, 12thman.com slash askross. Uh, not a ton of questions this September, but lengthy in, questions in, that we're going to have to actually get a little more concise on. Uh, In-depth. In yeah, I, I would say questions. wordy, in-depth, yeah. uh, some opinions. Some slung around some analysis, in there. So analysis in there now, in the questions. That's I'm good. actually going right, to condense, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, because, okay. Because uh, even with a, a few questions, we could be here for a while if we, as we like to say, unpacked all this mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. each time. But uh, we will begin with Kevin Jennings. He's class of 87. He's from the New Braunfels areas, uh, area over there near San Antonio, San Marcos. Uh, basically, the <clears throat> after – a lot is put down on paper. The question is, why did Texas A&M pick seat geeks over other third-party ticket exchange providers, and what influence does Texas A&M have over the provider? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, a fair question. And he, he points out some things around service fees, and he ran an analysis um, over a, a game that he was looking at buying some tickets from and I don't I don't know all the algor algorithms around why fees are certain certain ways uh, he talked about you know an $80 service fee in one transaction and so th those are things that you know that we'll look at Kevin but basically here here's how it works is the 12th man foundation is the ticket provider for Texas A&M athletics they we have a contract with the 12th man foundation they run our entire ticketing operation um, and, and we're in partnership with them on that endeavor. And then there's a software system called Pacquiolan mm -hmm. that runs our ticketing service platform. So everything online, when you make a transaction, you buy a seat, it all runs through what's called Pacquiolan. Then Pacquiolan then goes out and works with the secondary provider. So they're the ones out controlling that that contract. So they're the ones that went out and formed a, a formal relationship with SeatGeek. Uh, he mentions that maybe we had StubHub before. I don't believe we've ever run our own internal secondary market or exchange pro. It all goes through Pacquiolan. Pacquiolan then comes up with the right kind of partnerships. Um, and so that that's really how the, the layers work, Kevin, is 12th Man Foundation, Pacquiolan, Pacquiolan to SeatGeek, and look, technology is going to keep evolving. Mm -hmm. Every single year, there's a new widget, there's a new app, there's new something. So this is definitely something that we're going to, you know, keep on the radar and make sure that we have the the, the best platforms. And what we always kind of hear from, especially in baseball and maybe basketball, is those seats are sold. How do we get them in the hands of people that can go? Mm -hmm. 
football kind of takes care of itself. And so that that's always something that we want to make sure that Aggies are filling the seats. And Packy Owen does a great job as a service provider. They work with SeatGeek and and uh, try to make those transactions as, as seamless as, uh, as possible. So we have a little bit of say-so, uh, but overall we're going to rely on the experts, mm-hmm. and, uh, and that's Packy Olin and our folks in the 12th Man Foundation to make sure that we're, we're doing this at the highest level. All right. Off and running mm-hmm. with the 12th Man here. Let's continue. Dan Collins is class of 90 from Dallas. We'll be heading up his way this weekend mm-hmm. uh, for the game against Arkansas. And, it's a Reed Arena question. Uh, he's looking for improvements to Reed Arena. Mm-hmm. And, again, there was a lot to unpack with Dan, but essentially his question is when would we yeah. see improvements uh, to Reed Arena? Yeah, and I think part of, part of his question is um, the university, the system, recently announced that there's $5 billion worth of capital projects that are in the capital plan. Uh, and there's different layers to that um, as that capital plan gets submitted. And athletics, we have some pieces on there. Actually, Reed Arena is listed on the capital plan as a $125 million project. That's a that's a placeholder uh, number. And so, but what happens is you have to fund it. So just because we throw out, here's a $5 billion capital plan, that doesn't mean all of those projects are funded. Some have funding identified most of them do not. <clears throat> and so as the process unfolds, who's going to pay for it? That's really the question. So we definitely have Reed Arena on the list. It is definitely a priority. It's just identifying where does the funding come from. We have made improvements to Reed Arena. If you take the Cox McFerrin practice facility, which is connected to Reed, it's not the arena itself, tons of improvements for the players training room, both locker rooms, both practice gyms, offices have all been upgraded with uh, with new coaching staffs. The players love it. Best setup, I think, in, in college basketball. <clears throat> new video board in the last, what, six years? Yes. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put in some new lights last year and made them better even for this year. And if you – everybody ask about LED lighting, now I'll, I'll really start Twitter on fire now <laughs> <clears throat> by mentioning LED lighting. We have LED lighting in volleyball. Right, and so when we have a big moment in volleyball, we're flashing the lights, so we have new lights. So we have done, you know, smaller things around Reed Arena to make sure that we can, you know, stay um, as modern as possible. The bigger pieces of Reed are going to take; it's really going to take a university partnership. That building is used much more than just athletics. It's then the center of campus. The West Campus continues to to grow and expand the master plan of the campus. Now we have uh, we have a transition in leadership at the university. Um, so it, it's on the list. It's a multi-purpose facility. We have a placeholder number. We would have to identify what's the exact plan and then what's the funding mechanism to, uh, to build the building. So uh, definitely something that we're keeping alive. And um, I think we've said it on this show many times. Do you build a new arena? Or do you renovate? Mm -hmm. And that's still something that's out there. We definitely need an arena of that size on this campus for other events. But what does that look like for basketball? Volleyball is going to continue to grow. What does that all look like? Uh, We have a practice facility connected to Reed Arena for for volleyball. So he he said, well, we get the complicated answer. (laughs) Yes. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Dan. It is a, it's not a linear, hey, if we do this, we'll get the, it's not linear. I wish it was. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to it, and uh, we're going to continue to to move that conversation forward. And because of graduations being there, you can't start anything until after that, where a lot of times, like, well, once yeah. the season ends, <clears throat> we can do this. Right. It's a longer yeah, that's, season, if you will, for real. Again, that's the other sort of rhythm of this thing, too, is when would you actually do construction? Because technically, we need that building until the middle of May, and you start in the middle of August. So that's only like three months. If you're thinking the basketball, you're thinking, right. oh, it's November, right. December. You can do it right, right after the last home game. So the, the rhythm and the sequencing of when to do construction to not disrupt major activity, or you have to move that activity temporarily somewhere else uh, within our campus or community. So 
it's not again back to it's not a linear approach because that building is used by multiple multiple constituents on this campus and that's a great thing mm -hmm. but it complicates it and uh, so we'll, we're going to keep it uh, keep it at the forefront keep planning keep discussing keep working with our our university partners in uh, in that conversation but read something needs to happen around fan experience and concessions and seating bowl we we totally understand that um, the environment was great last year it was because it was packed mm -hmm. and when reed is full fun place maybe to be. maybe you don't think about the restrooms and the concessions yeah. and those kind of things um, so sometimes you can get a little intoxicated by that but definitely we we need to do something uh, at, at some point in time but it's not like the starting points down the line you have what you yeah. would like to do already, you know what I yeah, mean? Like it's not right. like, oh, once they say you got your 125, right. oh, we'll start there. No, you've got that process right. for Reed and every other facility, right. correct? That's right. Absolutely. And that's that's where you go into a master plan, mm -hmm. if you will. But nothing nothing is free. <laughs> right? There everything has a cost mm -hmm. and somebody has to pay for it. So it's either athletics, it's either we ask our donors to help, it's increased revenue through seating. Maybe the university views it as a as a university asset for these other events. So those are all the things that you have to you have to map out uh, from a financing standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, Sutton Turner's back. Uh, class When's of the last time he's been number station? three in our questions? Yeah, he's a, he was behind. A sometimes bit. we make him first. <laughs> sometimes we save yeah. him for last. Yeah. I guess. Uh, but uh, but uh, Kevin and Dan, I think, beat him to the punch. Uh, so we're just going in order. Gotcha. Uh, chronological mm -hmm. yeah. order. That means today. Sutton sending yeah. October's question now. You know that. Hey, yes. Oh, he was challenged. <laughs> the, the gauntlet was thrown down, and you know he'll respond. Uh, he'll probably have that in. Yes, in time for October here momentarily. But uh, Sutton wants to discuss the Aggie band and travel. And here's a situation he brought up. Uh, if you remember, Texas and Alabama mm -hmm. played a home-and-home -home football series that they just mm -hmm. completed this mm -hmm. year. When Alabama went to Austin last year, you notice that the Alabama band was up in the third deck, and I mm -hmm. think when Texas went to Alabama this year, the Crimson Tide returned the favor. Oh, they did. I believe. Okay. Okay. Yes, I believe I think that I saw was the something case. About that. Yeah. Uh, but he's also talking about Texas A&M's band, the the Fighting Texas Aggie band, traveling mm -hmm. to games. He actually uh, composed his question. I think he said <laughs> while sitting in Hard Rock Stadium while the Aggies were playing Miami this year. Well, the A and M band, the, the Fight Tech Aggie band, didn't travel right, to right. that game. So, Sutton has a two-part question here. Uh, first, dealing with the Aggie band traveling, uh, why can't A and M athletics use some of the TV money, which he describes as massive, to make sure mm -hmm. the full band travels to every game and performs, not the 100-member band that cannot perform, but the full band? That's the first part. Okay, let's take that question. <clears throat> so, we do provide funding to the band for travel. Um, they they then decide how they deploy that and which games they want to travel to. But we do give them a supplement uh, for the band to travel uh, to away games, and sometimes it just it just doesn't work out. Um, each each visiting team band has to communicate with the home team band in April of preceding the season mm -hmm. to say, "Hey, we're bringing a small small hundred." piece band let's say or we'd like to bring the full band to this game what's going on for that game and then the home team decides do they perform or not that's not that's not we can't just force ourselves to say we're absolutely going to perform at every road game it may not fit they may have homecoming they may have a presentation their band may be performing there may be some other activities so that's why they communicate in the spring to know what's going on you know, for those particular games. So it's not as easy as saying we can take the full band to every game and they'll absolutely perform. Mm -hmm. They can perform in the stands, and we see that often. Uh, but there is funding given from athletics um, to the band, and then it's not a cookie-cutter approach in terms of they always can perform uh, that aspect of it. So it's not uh, back to not, not an easy answer. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. Right. Mm -hmm. um, even this is complicated because there's all kinds of different uh, layers to it. So that's uh, that's the first part of the question. Yeah, and the next part is Sutton asks, will the SEC's ADs band together? And he says, <laughs> pun intended. 
Uh, and make sure that every SEC home team provides the visiting ban seats in the customary first deck and is given enough tickets that they are able to perform and represent their school. All right, so let's get into this part of it. In the SEC, it's a requirement. First of all, you have to provide up to 5,000 tickets for the visiting team. And the visiting team can say, we only need 4,000 of those tickets, or we need 3,000. But 5,000 is the, is the minimum um, if the visiting team chooses to accept all of those 5,000. 2,500 must be in the lower seating bowl. And then your band would sit in those lower 25. So you're taking away the part of the 2,500 seating capacity by putting your band in there. And then not every stadium is the same as far as lower bowl versus upper bowl. As an example, where I came from, there is no upper deck. It's all one, one seating bowl, right, at right. Ole Miss. Mm-hmm. So there's no way to – so everybody's in the lower seating bowl. At LSU, there's several decks, right? Mississippi State has a double-decker stadium. Mm-hmm. So not every stadium is the same, but that's the policy. 2,500 seats in the lower seating bowl. Oklahoma actually just announced a reconfiguration of their seating, their seating bowl at, uh, at their football stadium to accommodate the SEC policy. Texas will have to do the same thing at some point in time where they have to at least have 2,500 seats in the lower seating bowl for the visiting team. The visiting team elects to take all of those or not, and then you have to have another 2,500 in the stadium. So 5,000 total. Your band then sets in the lower seats. Mm-hmm. So that that's how the process works. So really there's nothing that we need to change as far as the band. And it's really it really goes back to the first the first answer. Communicate in April. What do the activities look like? Yes, we want to bring our full band to these games. Can we even perform? Do we have to stay in the stands? All of those things get worked out in the spring. And then athletics uh, here at A&M, we do provide uh, some funding for the fight in Texas Aggie band. We we hope they can go to every – I mean, Saturday is going to be great. Yeah. Arlington, mm, we, yeah. we know what that looks like. Yeah. Um, but it's not uh, it's not as easy as it may uh, may sound on the front end. But that that's how it works. And some schools in, uh, they extend that invitation. They want the fight in Texas Aggie right. band to play at halftime. There's right. that appreciation for them. Yeah. They want their uh, fans I, to sit. Definitely is. So then it's a matter of does it fit? Mm-hmm. Does it fit their script? Yeah. Does it fit the timing? It's usually seven to eight minutes, right, of time that it takes. Mm-hmm. So if their band is also performing, then that. That you only that get 20 minutes now in, in college because it, right. it used to be home team decides how long halftime right. is. It's, right. Now it's a, a we strict were, uh, 20 before minutes. Before you got here, Andrew, we were joking out in the hallway. Um, <laughs> I watch a lot of high school football now on Friday nights. 28-minute <laughs> halftimes. <laughs> I'm not sure each half takes 20 minutes. 28-minute 28 minute halftimes. And both, game, yeah. Typically, both bands perform. Yeah, right, right. And But, I mean, they bring out, they bring out these elaborate – stages yeah. and setups and displays i mean it's a, it's really cool mm-hmm. to watch the high school slightly bands but longer, 28 minutes can you imagine longer that than the old orange bowl halftime remember how well, long wait, that, wait, 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 I, somebody posed the question how long is the super bowl halftime i mean you've got to be 30 yeah it's got to be 30 35 and, minutes uh, yeah. somewhere I mean, in there it's, yeah. it's elaborate yeah <laughs> Just, and then regular season nfl is 15 boom I mean, it's it goes quick. by fast. I will say that about an NFL game. You watch it, and you feel like they're yeah. right back out there yeah. for the third quarter, right. and it doesn't take long at all. Right. Yeah. That's right. No so, marching bands in the NFL. No marching bands. Not any With longer. rare yeah. exceptions. No. And yeah, they're, Not they're any gone. longer. Yeah. Not since Baltimore moved to Indianapolis. Baltimore. That Colt band. Was Washington used to, used to yeah. have Washington one. used to have a band. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but no, good Good question, Sutton, on uh, on the fight in Texas. And we have a great, we have a great relationship with – the core with the band. I mean, we we partner with them on as many things as possible, and obviously they're a huge part of game day, and we want to continue that. And uh, hopefully they can go to as many games as possible You're on the road. You're constantly over there, aren't you? As co- yeah, as, as, yeah. as often as yeah, you can. Yeah, it's just neat. It's just neat. One, what they stand for. We went out and ran with them uh, with the whole core <laughs> last week at uh, at 5:45 in the morning. They do a spirit run uh, on home game weekends, and just to see. The discipline, the approach, the the organization of it. I mean, every morning they're out there at 545, basically standing at attention, getting in formation, starting their PT. So it's just just a cool representation of what makes A&M, you know, special. And so whatever we can do to support them, that's what we want to do. Buzz has been over yeah. to the core a lot lately. Yeah. I know we've had some other teams 
uh, working with our core cadets, and so it's uh, it's really neat to cool. have that relationship. Uh, real quick before you go, uh, not from the 12th man here, but just uh, Arkansas week. We're going to Arlington. Uh, they are on the schedule next year, 2024, for right. Arlington again. And then uh, there, there's just not clarity after that. You don't right. know if Arkansas is even on the schedule. Uh, but if so, home and home after that, if, if we're seeing yeah. the Razorbacks in 2025 and beyond. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll definitely play Arkansas um, after 2024. But we'll play them uh, really twice over a four-year period. Mm -hmm. And it'll be on campus. It'll be uh, home and home. On campus, we don't know exactly the the format yet. Mm -hmm. Do we stay at eight conference games or go to nine mm -hmm. conference games? We've said it on here numerous times. We're a proponent of nine. We want to go to nine conference games, but in either format, there's no divisions. Arkansas would not be one of our permanent opponents, so we would play them twice over a four-year period, the rotating. But yeah. those games would return back to campus. So mm -hmm. there's two years left on the current agreement with AT&T Stadium, and then after that, you're not going to play them every year, so it doesn't make sense to play a, a neutral site um, anymore. And, the, and those games, I've, I've said it, those games should be on, on campus. We're playing an SEC opponent. Those games should be on campus, and uh, that's how we view it. And But we'll embrace it, these last two, and mm -hmm. hopefully uh, go up there and play well and have a great turnout, and it'll be fun. And then in the future... We're there for a Cotton Bowl, a semifinal, or a championship game. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> twelve-team playoff starts next year. That people know about it. Yeah, but think about it. next. We're going to be sitting here next year uh -huh. talking about twelve teams getting into a college football playoff. Yeah, your margin for error can increase. Mm -hmm. There's going to be two lost teams that make the oh, playoffs. No. And then the question: right. Does but a nine and three to, team but, make it? There could right. be one and of those. Or nine two. and three. SEC from a nine-game schedule, right? right? That, so mm -hmm. strength of schedule is going to play right. an awful that's right. lot into that's that. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's something that, you know, again, it's kind of out there, but in the heat of the season, no one's really thinking about that. A year from now, we're going to be sitting here going, okay, how do you position yourself? What's the schedule look like? What is your strength of schedule? How does that match? Who are the matchups down the stretch to put yourself in that position? I just did uh, – to go off a little bit uh, off script, I just did a mock uh, selection process with the college football playoff last week uh, up in Dallas, and pretty fascinating to see. And you couldn't go through. We we looked at the 2021 season. Mm. I was hoping we'd do 2020, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. so I could pound my fist on the table. Um, did we get in this time? <laughs> 21. Uh, we did. We did that's make that. We did make that. Yeah. If, yeah, so that, that's, head head if you had done 2020, that's what we, we'd be asking. That's did right. we get in? There were 12 teams. Absolutely. We 2021. Yeah. We finished 25th in the final CFP ranking in uh, 2021, and in in the mock the mock process, uh, we stayed the same. We finished in, in 25th, but it was really fascinating. We we did a 12 team oh. mock as well. And you looked at it, and right now there's six automatic qualifiers and six at largest, the way it's formatted right, right now, now. Right now. Mm -hmm. There's talk about maybe changing that with everything going on with the Pac-12. And then it's the six highest-ranked conference champions. There is a conference champion ranked 23rd in our mock poll. Wow. Wow. That's not the 12 best teams. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So something has to change. Yeah. And then you looked at the – so then we said, okay, what if it changes to the top five – the lowest ranked champion was 15th. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe maybe you can live with that. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's where it gets into this whole discussion about what's fair, who are the best teams, what are these matchups. The group of five, I think, needs some access for sure. But if we're talking about the sixth conference champion ranked 23rd, mm -hmm. I think people are going to be like, right. why are we doing this? Yeah. That's not the best yeah. teams. So – a lot, lot to play out, but it was fascinating being part of that process to see tons of data, tons of metrics. But it, it really comes down to you as a committee member, who do you think are the best teams? That's what it comes down to. Yeah. And you can – I mean, they can put four teams up on the grid, and you can compare four teams and why – this team's 10-2, and two, but this team's 11-1. and one. Uh, The big debate in 2021 was around um, Cincinnati – Mm -hmm. Cincinnati was undefeated. Mm -hmm. They made they, the fourteen. They, they made the playoff. Mm -hmm. They beat Notre Dame on the road. Mm -hmm. That was their marquee. If they had not, if they hadn't played Notre Dame but still went undefeated, I, I don't know if they would have made it. Right. 
I'm not sure they would have made it. Right. Mm-hmm. But that one marquee game, because their strength of schedule was not good. Right. So it was just fascinating yeah. to go through it and yeah. so a good exercise. So with the Pac-2, Washington State or Oregon State's in the playoff they could every be in the year. Playoff. <laughs> they could be in the playoff. That's right. That's right. So, but next year we'll be talking about that. <laughs> That's right. 12, and saying, okay, wow. it's all right. An, it's what do the Aggies, what are the Aggies have to do? Landscape. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. No doubt. Uh, but this week it's up to Arlington. We'll see you there. All right. Safe travels. See you guys there. Gig'em. Thank you. All right. For Andrew and Ross, I'm Will. Thanks for joining us on this edition in the south end zone of Kyle Field.